figured it was fitting. It's been a while since we've looked at a hymn uh, as we consider the fact that tonight's what we call our singing night. It's an opportunity for us to sing praises to God and encourage one another in song. It's edifying, it's uplifting. We sing songs that encourage, that uh, prepare us for the week ahead. And number 162, Keith spoiled it for me this morning, uh, but we're going we're gonna to sing it again. I told Keith I was going to call him out. He, he, he led number 162, I had no idea I had planned to, to speak on it this, this afternoon. But number, number 162, a lot of times we get used to having certain hymns led at certain times during the course of our worship service. We have certain hymns that uh, lend themselves more to invitation songs. We have certain hymns that may uh, lend themselves more to uh, preparation for a lesson or a sermon. Certain hymns that uh, prepare us for the Lord's Supper. And typically, number 162 is a hymn that we sing in preparation for the Lord's Supper. But I'd like to take a look at these words and consider the fact that sometimes uh, hymns are written and uh, granted that the, the tone and the melody of the hymn tend to be perhaps in this case more somber. But this is a hymn that could be led at any time during our worship. In fact, today we're going to use it as an invitation song. I want you to consider with me the words of this hymn, just for a few minutes with me this afternoon. Night with ebon pinion. Verse 1, night with ebon pinion, brooded o'er the veil. All around was silent, save the night wind's wail. When Christ, the man of sorrows, in tears is sweat and sweat as blood, prostrate in the garden, raised his voice to God. This is describing the night in which Jesus was betrayed, the night before he was crucified, as he goes to Gethsemane and is praying to his Father. I want to consider with you just for a moment what this hymn is meant to bring to our minds. We have several different accounts uh, of this hymn, Matthew chapter 26, or of this uh, occasion that the hymn describes. Matthew chapter 26, Mark chapter 14, and Luke chapter 22. And in, these, in this occasion, Jesus has come to this place. He's going to uh, take three of his closest uh, disciples with him a little deeper into Gethsemane. And then he's going to go a little bit further after that to pray three times to his father. But I want you to consider when we sing Eben Pinion, for instance, what is Eben Pinion? A lot of times we sing hymns and sometimes they're maybe uh, old English type of words that we may not recognize. And so it's helpful for us to be able to take a look at these terms and understand what it is we're singing when we're singing it. Night with Eben. Uh, eben, the term Eben means having the characteristics of ebony, dark, deep, black evening. Keep in mind, they didn't have street lights and street lamps, I and mean, they had you know, candles and so forth, but that's not going to shed a whole bunch of light. But you've got to figure, this is, uh, in fact, we're going to have a, a map here, there we go, to kind of get the geography of what our hymn is, is showing us. This is Jerusalem right here. Here's Golgotha. This is where Jesus was crucified to the north of Jerusalem. Here you've got Gethsemane. Gethsemane... Uh, in fact, different accounts between the, the three accounts, we know that they're at the Mount of Olives, and then some of the accounts mention Gethsemane. Both are true. Gethsemane is actually an estate in the Mount of Olives. Gethsemane, the name actually uh, implies uh, an oil press or a place where they um, create olive oil. So that's what Gethsemane, in fact, it's actually pronounced Gethsemane. Never heard of it that way. We say Gethsemane, but it's Gethsemane. Uh, and this, this particular place is an estate in the Mount of Olives. And so this is where they are. And this is the Kidron Valley. And, and that's important within the context of our hymn as well. So this Kidron Valley goes all the way uh, north and south across the, the east side of Jerusalem. So when you think about this hymn, Night with Eben Pinion Brooded or the Veil. The term veil is an old uh, way of saying valley. And so the, the reference to Valley Kidron. Uh, is, is what this hymn is describing. So imagine Jesus here in this place, and, and it's an elevated place, the Mount of Olives. It's called the Mount of Olives for a reason. It's a mountain. And so you have an elevated place where you could see over the valley. You could see Jerusalem. Picture a dark night. And notice how all around was silent. Of course, they didn't have planes and trains and semis. No noise. It's completely silent, save the night wind's wail. Kind of picture in your mind a breeze 
going through the trees at the Mount of Olives. All these olive trees and the sound, the whistle that you kind of hear from the eerie sound, somber sound that you hear when wind travels through branches. When Christ, the man of sorrows and tears and sweat as blood, prostrate in the garden, raised his voice to God. As Jesus comes to this garden, he's left his, 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 I guess you could say, the three closest to him. And now he's gone further into the garden and he's all alone. But notice the agony that's being described here in tears and sweat as blood. In Luke chapter 22 and in verse 44, we're told that he was sweating as if great drops of blood. There's this human side of Jesus, this anxiety, this anticipation of what is to come. And he knows what it is he's going to suffer. He knows what it is he's going to go through. That term, night with ebon pinion, that term pinion means the wing of a bird. The wing of a bird. So like a, a crow or a raven, very dark. And it's this idea of this darkness splitting through the night. And so when you think about this darkness, Jesus by himself, this anxiety, and you picture him in this garden, we think about in Mark chapter 14 and in verse 33 and 34, uh, we're told that Jesus was troubled and deeply distressed. His soul was exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. And this idea of prostrate on the ground is this concept of to cast in oneself on the ground in humility and submission. And we see this in Matthew chapter 26 and in verse 39, how that he falls on his face and prays to his Father. Verse 2 of our hymn, Smitten for offenses which were not his own, he for our transgressions had to weep alone. No friend with words to comfort, no hand to help was there when the meek and lowly humbly bowed in prayer. When we consider our Lord as he's in this garden and he knows what's coming, this term smitten means to be, to be beaten, he's smitten for offenses that they had nothing to do with his, any, any sin of his. He's being smitten for our offenses. We know this. He's being smitten because of the sin of the world. He has to take on the sin of the world, die because of the sins of the world, and suffer. He, for our transgressions, had to weep alone. No friend with words to comfort, nor hand to help was there. You know, it's interesting that in Luke chapter 22 and in verse 43, an angel does come and is there to minister to our Lord. But in the very next verse, verse 44, that's when Jesus is deeply distressed and he's sweating like great drops of blood. So even with the angel there to strengthen him, it's not, he has no human companionship there in the garden by himself. His three, the three that he's left, they're asleep, even though he told them to be watchful. He's warned them several times and they keep falling asleep. And here in verse 44 and 40, 43 and 44, Jesus, despite an angel coming to strengthen him, is still in agony. He's still alone. When the meek and lowly, a lot of times we think of meek as being weak. No, he's humble. That, that, that concept of humility and meekness goes hand in hand. Humbly bowed uh, in prayer. Verse 3. Abba, Father, Father, if indeed it may, let this cup of anguish pass from me, I pray. Yet if it must be suffered by me, thine only Son, Abba, Father, Father, let thy will be done. This is his prayer. This is what he prays three times in the garden. And notice in the words of this prayer, I'm going to kind of skip through this real quick. The words of this prayer he prays this, recognizing both the, the human side of him. He's asking that this cup uh, be, be passed, if there's any way possible, for there another, be another way to accomplish the opportunity for the, for the salvation of mankind, for sins to be taken away. But he knows full well that there's not. But notice, despite everything that he's going through, and knows what he's about to go through, notice what it comes down to. 
Yet if it must be suffered by me, thine only son, Abba, Father, Father, let thy will be done. It's the ultimate example of submission to and yielding to the will of God. And he, granted, he's, he's God, but he is the son and the father has the authority and he is yielding, submitting to that authority and that will of the father, even though he doesn't want to. It's not that he doesn't love us. But as a human being, if you knew what you were about to go through, imagine, just imagine what your emotional state, your mental state would be in anticipation of the terrible suffering and agony that you're about to face. When we think about this term Abba, I want to center on this from verse 3. There's not really an English term that can be used to translate this word other than daddy. When we refer to our father as dad, or, or it recognizes the relationship. Father is the, the recognition of authority. It is the recognition of the role, the position that the father serves in that authority. But Abba focuses on the relationship, the love, the connection of family there. That's what Abba carries with it. So when Jesus prays, Abba, Father, He's recognizing both elements of that relationship to the Father. There is the role that the Father serves, the authority that He has, the submissive tone, but there's also this deeply connected love and, and trust within our Lord as He addresses the Father. So when Jesus prays this, let this cup pass from me, but not as I will, but as Thou will. It's a great lesson for us to recognize that we have to submit our will to the fathers. There's a lot, going to be a lot of things in this life. We already know it. We've already counted it. And there's going to be more. Opportunities and times where we can put our will in front of what we know God wants us to do. And yet take Jesus' example to heart and recognize the need to submit our will. Even though it's something we may want to do. Or in this case... Maybe we're going to suffer in some form or fashion. Maybe we're going to be ridiculed or persecuted in some way. Maybe we're going to have to sacrifice something because of what God would want us to do in that particular situation. Well, think of Jesus and what it was that he was willing to give up. Now look at number 162 as a whole. And look at the progression that this hymn takes. Jesus, verse 1 focuses on the agony, the human nature of him anticipating this terrible trial that he's going to face. Verse 2 focuses him on being alone. The fact that there's no one there to help him. Yes, he's praying to his father. Yes, an angel comes, but there's no human comfort. His friends have gone to sleep. He's all alone. And then verse 3 is about him in prayer. Praying to God, praying to his father, in essence, recognizing that the Father's will must be done. And he, full, he knows full well that that will includes him having to die for the opportunity for forgiveness of sins for you and for me. This hymn, Night with Evan Pinion, when we sing it here in just a second as an invitation song, instead of thinking about it in relationship to the Lord's Supper, which a lot of times we sing hymns, and a lot of times that's the first thing that comes to our mind because that's when we sing them. Think about Night with Evan Pinion as a reminder of the terrible sacrifice that our Lord was willing to endure and what response is necessary on my part in order to acknowledge that sacrifice. If I'm not a Christian, I need to realize that Jesus died for me. He was willing to suffer all of that to fulfill His Father's will, to give you and me the opportunity of salvation. Don't let that sacrifice go to waste. That sacrifice was made for you so that you could have your sins washed away. For those of us who are Christians, let's remember, not just before the Lord's Supper, but every day and at every point in our worship, exactly what Jesus was willing to go through. Both His Godhood, His, his divinity, Yes, he's God, but he's very human also. 
And he had every motion you and I go through. He was tempted at all points, such as, as we. And yet he was without sin. And he fully submitted to the will of the Father, even to the point of being tortured and killed. Let's make sure we let that be a motivation to be faithful to our God, calling on him, Abba, Father, and recognizing the relationship we have with the Father, all because of our Lord and what he was willing to do for us. That's the lesson for you this afternoon. The invitation is extended. If you're subject, we're going to sing number 162. Use this as an opportunity to make yourself right with God. If you're subject, please come forward as we stand and sing.